this morning uh, specifically to hear, uh, ask questions about that. That's why she came, and uh, the Lord had me preaching on that, and uh, so uh, it, it was a blessing. God had prepared her heart and uh, the message in mind, so that was a blessing. So Genesis chapter 22, verse number 1. Genesis 22, verse number 1. I want to rehearse a story for you. It's, a, uh, it's an old story. It's a well-known story, and uh, I want to relate it to your life and mine here in the here and now. And hopefully that will be a blessing to you. And it came to pass after these things that God did tempt Abraham and said unto him, Abraham, and he said, Behold, here, uh, uh, here I am. And he said, Take now thy son, thine only son Isaac, whom thou lovest, and get thee into the land of Moriah, and offer him there for a burnt offering upon one of the mountains which I will tell thee of. And Abraham arose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took two of his young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood uh, for the burnt offering, and rose up and went unto the place of which God had told him. Then on the third day, Abraham lifted up his eyes and saw the place afar off. All right, now understand, they've traveled three days, and now they're looking up, and it's still afar off. <laughs> and Abraham said unto his young men, Abide ye here with the ass, and I and the lad will go yonder and worship and come again to you. And Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it upon Isaac his son, and took, he took the fire in his hand and the knife, and they went both of them together. And Isaac spake unto Abraham his father and said, My father, he said, Here uh, am I, my son. And he said, Behold the fire and the wood, but uh, where is the lamb for the burnt offering? And Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. So they went both of them together. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound Isaac his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. Notice he had to call him twice at that point to make sure he heard him. And he said, Here am I. And he said, Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou any uh, any, anything unto him, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son. Seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. And Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah-Jireh. As it is said to this day, in the mount of the Lord it shall be. Verse 15 goes on, and I want to read down to verse 19. The angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven the second time and said, By myself, by myself I have, have I sworn, saith the Lord. For because thou hast done this thing, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, that in blessing I will bless thee. And in multiplying, I will multiply thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the sea shore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemy. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. So Abraham returned unto his young men, and they rose up and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham dwelt at Beersheba. I want to talk to you about tonight is giving our best giving our best why because when you give your best to God you don't give it up and when you give God your best it's reflected back on you more about that in a moment let's pray father tonight this old old story about how you called out to Abram and he followed and obeyed and trusted, believed in you. 
Father, we ask for your blessing and your help tonight that we might, as it says in the New Testament, the Old Testament is for our learning. These, these things were written for us to learn and then to implement these things in our own lives. I pray that you'd help us to give you our best. You deserve that. That we might get your best, even though we don't deserve it. We ask for your help tonight. I pray that you'd use me to communicate effectively and truthfully, and that you might cause us to blossom and come forth and shine, and so that the we, we won't have room to receive all the blessings. We'll thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. You know, it's, it's human nature. We often like to keep the best for us, don't we? We do. Because as I said this morning, we're selfish, and self-centered. And, man, I want the best for me. I believe that's got why God said he wants the first fruits of our increase. Because then we're putting him before us. And so my question tonight, my, my thought in coming before you this evening is, have you committed to Christ your best? Or are you giving him the leftovers? He deserves the first fruits. Because truthfully, if it wasn't for him, we wouldn't have any fruit. By the way, uh, you know the story here of Abraham and, and Isaac and, uh, and how long Abraham and Sarah waited for their son Isaac. And all the efforts that went into getting a son, doing it the wrong way. And God finally comes through. And, and did, was it not God that gave Isaac to Abraham and Sarah? It was. It, it, if it wasn't for God, there wouldn't be an Isaac. There would never be an Isaac. And, and Abraham and Sarah both were way too old to even think about having kids. But God made it so that they did. I remember a time in my young Christian life when we lived downstairs and the Lapar family lived upstairs you know what brother Lapar's favorite night of the week was leftover night <laughs> because they would get their leftovers and they'd bring them down to our house and we'd get our leftovers out or we'd get our leftovers and take them up to their house and it was a smorgasbord of wonderful I'm just here to tell you How many of y'all would invite folks over and serve them leftovers? That's not normal, is it? That's not normally, well, listen, we got a half a pizza here. And, man, with th this, well, this is almost too old, but we're going to pull this out because we need it gone. That's not normal, is it? So why is it normal we give God leftovers? We won't serve them to strangers, but God, we'll, man, God, if I have anything left over when I'm done with this month, I'll, I'll sure give it to you. If I got anything left over this week, I'll sure, I'll sure sacrifice it for you. <laughs> Listen, that, that don't sound, that don't even sound right. That don't even sound right. I remember my first preacher talking about tithing and giving and giving to missions and how God would bless. And you know, as a newly saved young person, it was, it was really hard to get my mind wrapped around how that worked. I mean, I was an E5 in the Navy, had uh, a wife and, and daughters. 
I barely had enough money to buy food for them every week. You got paid twice a month. Can you imagine? The, the, you get paid on the 1st and the 15th. And that's a long time before the next check. And man, that was sometimes you got your paycheck and, you know, you, you, all your bills and everything. And okay, all of a sudden, wait a minute. <laughs> there ain't much left. And then you hear your preacher say, you know, tithing and giving to missions and all that. And you're thinking, how can I even do that? Financially, that's, that's impossible. Friends, can I tell you something? God works that out. And when you honor him with the first fruit, I've told the testimony before, there was more than one time, but this one time just sticks out in my mind where I come home, got the paycheck. By the end of the day, it's already gone. Our bills are paid. Everything's paid. <clears throat> and, uh, I mean, it, it's, it's automatic withdrawals. You're overseas everything like that so i get home well got paid today here's the statement uh and uh she's like well what do we got left for for groceries i said well if i don't pay the tithes you got this much if i do pay the tithes you don't have it anything well we don't have milk for the kids she was talking about me we don't have milk we don't have bread i need a little something and we both got down we prayed and we said the lord will take care of it and i wrote the check out and set it on the counter to go to church the next time and it wasn't long after that that ding 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 somebody rang the bell from the street handed us an envelope through the thing so the lord told us to bring you this and it was that was over a hundred dollars in one dollar bills in that envelope Here's your grocery money, dear. Another time, we did the same thing, and this time it was sacks of groceries that came. Now, what am I telling you? I'm telling you that when you give the first fruit, God always reflects that back. God takes care of you because he owns the cattle on a thousand hills and the wealth in every mine. It's all his, and so he, he can direct things the way he needs to. Now, You know, I could have been proud with that person that handed the, the envelope of cash and said, no, 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 we don't need your money. You just take that and go give it to somebody else. But you know what I saw? I saw the hand of God. I'm going to obey God, and God's going to honor that, and he's going to make sure that my family has what I need. You know why I thought that way? Because the preacher told me that that's the way it worked. I, didn't, I wasn't sure that I believed him at the time, but he, he seemed to be an honest guy. And so I said, well, the preacher says it and taught it from the Bible. It must be so. So we trusted, and time and time again, God proved himself. Here in our story, Abraham has Isaac, his son. And God says, give him to me. That's a hard thing. But this story is a direct challenge and a direct instruction that, that God should get our very best. Now listen, he didn't say, give me the other son, the son of a maidservant. He said, give me the one you've been praying for your whole life. Can I just say it this way? Abraham was called on to give God his best. And um, God calls, and God deserves our best. I want you to notice a couple of passages. Turn into the New Testament, Matthew chapter 22 with me, Matthew 22. And I want you to notice verse 35, Matthew 22, 35. Um, We're going to read starting verse 34, I think. But when the, pub, the, when the Pharisees had heard that he had uh, put the Sadducees to silence, they were gathered together. Then one of them, 
which was a lawyer, asked him a question, tempting him, saying, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, and with all thy mind. Now, listen, you can look at that several ways, but let me just help you. That's everything. Love him with everything that you have. Everything that you are. Make sure He is the preeminence of everything that you think. He said in verse 38, This is the first and great commandment. This is above everything else. God ought to be preeminent in our lives. The second is like unto it, that thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. On these two commandments hang all the law and the prophets, it says. To love God with everything that we are. So listen, He deserves our best. He calls for our best. Back up to Matthew chapter number 6. I want you to notice here. Uh, everything that you are. And, and then to be very specific, in Matthew chapter 6, He talked about uh, everything that we have. Verse 30, uh, verse 19. Let's start at verse 19. He says, lay not up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust doth corrupt and where thieves break through and steal. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust doth corrupt and where thieves do not break through nor steal. For where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. All right? Now, jump down. We could read all this, but verse 24, no man can serve two masters, he'll hate the one and love the other, or else he'll hold to the one and despise the other. Just jump down to verse uh, 33 tonight. But seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things, and that is the worldly things, that is the necessity things, all these things shall be added unto you. He says, take no thought. Take how much thought? No thought for the morrow, for the morrow shall take the thought for the things of itself. Sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. Now, I'm not telling you don't have a, you shouldn't have savings. I'm not telling you shouldn't try to put some away. Uh, you know, the problem in, in America is not that we couldn't save, not that we couldn't tithe. The problem is we don't often do those things. We spend all our money on fun stuff and good stuff and things that we like. We blow it all on that uh, oftentimes, and then we don't have enough to do the important things. That's frequently what happens. I'm not saying every case. I'm just saying... More often than not, we blow our money. I was just reading, you know, the, uh, the uh, several states, ours included, has just cut off the unemployment extra benefits. And I heard one guy, he responded, it's like, but I only have 88 cents left in my account. Guess it's time to go to work. If you've get, been getting, getting $300 over and above your normal, you know, unemployment check, the only reason you'd have 88 cents left is you did something silly with the money that God provided through the U.S. government, even though it was just paper. I mean, something went wrong there, I would have to say. Because that was extra. That was over and above what you would have normally got had you worked a regular job. So what did you do with all that? Now, I, I don't know his specific case. I'm just making an illustration here that fraud, waste, and abuse is, is often the case, not only in the upper parts of the government, but way down in the lower ranks of our own households as well. Uh, and I can, I can, I don't know, it's a guess on my part, but I probably suspect he didn't pay his tithes either on all that. Just saying. God says we ought to honor Him with our substance. Uh, giving of our best. And uh, by the way, look at Luke 9. Here He calls for the best uh, in another area that I'll point out while we're thinking about this thought. Luke chapter 9. Notice with me verse number 21. Luke chapter 9 verse 21. Well, 21 to 26. Um, 
And he straightly charged them, commanding them that they tell no man that, that thing, saying, The Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected for the elders and chief priests and scribes, be slain and raised the third day. And he said unto them all, If any man, notice this, will come after me, let him what? Deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Verse 24, For whosoever will save his life shall lose it, but whosoever will lose his life for my sake the same shall save it. See, there's this principle played out in, in the area of loyalty as well. You want to try to save your life? The last thing you want to do is try to hoard it for yourself. Because God says, I'm not going to help you with that. But if you'll invest it, and if you'll follow me, and you'll commit to me, if you'll be loyal to me, then I'll be loyal to you, and we'll all be ahead there. Verse 25, for what uh, is a man advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be a castaway? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he, uh, and when he shall come in his own glory and his fathers and of the holy angels. What's he saying? He's saying God requires and desires our best of our whole being. Certainly of our possessions, but also of our loyalties and our commitments. I believe we ought to raise the bar, raise the standard in our own lives of what we give to God and what we do for God in our service. Let's go back um, to our text in Genesis 22, and let me give you another thought here, uh, looking at verses 3 to 8 and just pointing something out to you. And Abraham arose early in the morning and saddled his ass and took of his two young men with him and Isaac his son and clave the wood rose up and went to the place which God had told him of. Then on the third day, I want you to notice that Abraham did not wait. He didn't pray about it. He didn't drag his feet. In fact, I don't know, if this was me, if I was Abraham, I'm just going to say this, I probably wouldn't have slept well the night before. God, you want me to take my son tomorrow and offer him? You want me to leave here tomorrow with my boy and offer him? What's Sarah going to say? I don't think I'd have slept much that night. But he got up early in the morning, and he went out and claved the wood and got everything gathered up, and he took a, a three-day hike plus to go to the place, and he did not delay. He didn't dawdle around. He went there. He got to the place. He saw the place. He headed up to the place. Had taken Isaac and the wood and the fire and the knife and went up the hill. And he went ahead. He just went ahead and got the altar set up and bound Isaac and had the knife ready to go. There was no delaying. There was no uh, hemming and hawing. There was no, hey, well, let's have a prayer meeting first to make sure that we really heard from God the right way. No, he just went and did what God told him to do. He didn't hesitate. He didn't grudge about it. He didn't fuss with God about it. And I'm just saying this, it would have cost Abraham his home life. I don't think Sarah would have let him back in the tent. I mean, would your wife let you back in the tent? Honey, where's, where's Guinevere? Well, we went for a walk, and she didn't come back. At my house, well, I don't know if I should say that. Going for a walk with the master of the, of the farm, um, if you're not one of the master's children, it means things aren't going to turn out well for you, if you know what I mean. Just saying, if, if a chicken goes for a walk with the master of the farm, he comes back ready for frying. So when I say, well, I'm going for a walk, well, who's going with you? My wife has to ask, and... Well, you know, Ben's going to go with me. Now, are you bringing him back, she wants to know? I'm just saying, I don't think Abraham would have been welcomed back to the tent if he didn't come back with the boy. I think it would have cost him incentive to live. Think about this. Over 100 years old, and you just offered on the altar your only son, to your God. I, I, I'm just telling you, I, I'd probably fall into some kind of depression, and, uh, and, and, and I'd doubt myself the rest of my life. Did I really hear right? Did I really do what I thought? Uh, I, man, was that the right thing to do? 
And then to do it myself, I'm, I, there might be a crazy person somewhere on the planet that would, that wouldn't bother, but I, it would bother me. I'm just saying, it would not be good. But Abraham responded, and he responded quickly. He didn't hesitate. He made no excuses. He got up early in the morning, took off on his journey, and, uh, and was ready to do the deed because God was preeminent in his life. He was willing to give God his best. And then let's notice something else starting in verse number 9. <clears throat> in uh, Genesis chapter 21, starting in verse number 9, name, uh, 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 let's see here, 21. Let me get to the right page. There we go. 22. Let me read the right place. And they came to the place which God had told him of, and Abraham built an altar there, laid the wood in order, and bound his son, uh, Isaac his son, laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. The angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, Here am I. Words, somebody calling your name never sounded so sweet as you got your knife above your son and you're about to offer him to hear God calling for you. Lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For I now know, for now know I, for now I know that thou fearest God, seeing that thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, from me. Verse 13 says, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram got caught in a thicket by his horns. Now, how did that ram get there? He didn't even know it got there. Didn't seem to be there before. Listen, Abraham was very pleased to discover. What did he discover? What you give to God isn't wasted, isn't gone. He committed his son, and not a hair is to be harmed. He got his child back. Now I'm thinking Isaac's a little frazzled. That's just my take on it. But I'll tell you this. Isaac served the Lord the rest of his life. I think he looked at Dad and said, Dad, really? God told him. And he probably heard the voice, Abraham, Abraham, lay not thine hand on the son. He was pleased to discover that one places on what one places on the altar, God's altar, isn't lost it isn't lost god honors that sacrifice just like i said about the tithing just like i said about the giving right you can't outgive god i'm sure you've heard that before that's not just a cliche saying by preachers to get the offerings up it's the truth it's the truth and i'll tell you th this isn't just a principle that i preach for you all I practice this. God sends me a blessing. I sit down at my desk and, all right, Lord, here's what you gave me. Here's what I got. The tithe is a tenth. Oh, I can't just do that. Because that's what's required. I got to do more than that. Lord, how much can I do of this? How much, how much faith do, are, are you going to give me so that I can do, how much will you let me do of this? I'm telling you what happens in my mind, in my heart, sitting at my desk, at my house, with my checkbook or whatever it is that God's given me. I, I'll give you another. You know, the bees. God gave me one hive of bees. I've got 31 or 32 now. They're just going crazy the last two years about a thousand on average a thousand pounds of honey this last year we went full time i quit working my wife had come to me and says uh, we've got a need well the church has given me a salary but you know, there, there's other things there. You know, when you got the family I got, that stuff happens. The washer's broke. 
the dryer's broke, this is broke, that's broke, the car's broke. Well, Lord, let's see what you got in the B money for me. Last year, she came to me, she goes, we need to buy school books. How much do you think you need? She goes, well, I know that's a lot of money. I said, order it. She goes, say what? I said, Here, here's the cash. Put it in the account and place it. Where did you get that? God put it in my drawer. I'm not lying to you. Show up here and put money in Brother Richie's jar or put money into the tithe, into the, uh, into the uh, things here with the boys. Where's that money come? Comes from the V money. That's where it comes from. And I don't even count that in my tithes and offerings. That's just surplus. That God can count it however he wants to. I'm not bragging. I'm just telling you. I want you to understand something. This isn't just a biblical principle that I can teach you. I've lived this for almost 30 years. She spent money on the school books. Here it is. She'd come back a week later. I need to get something, this and this. And there's no money left in the checkbook. Yeah, I know. I watched it. Here you go. Go buy what you... Where'd you get that from? God provided it. Through bee spit. And my sweat, of course. But, you know, they did all the real work. Again, I, I want you to understand something. I'm talking to you heart to heart. I'm not... I'm not that's just the way it is. I sit down and look through that envelope that God has for me, and and uh, God, how much of this can I use for you? And it, it, he, He's not failed. The meal of oil has not gone dry. And I'm praising the Lord for it. I'm just telling you, this, is, this isn't an Old Testament Genesis 22 principle. That, man, that's Old Testament. That don't work. I'm telling you, it still does. I'm thankful that he hasn't asked for Ben or Sam or Caleb or any of the girls either for that matter. But I'm just telling you, everything else becomes very easy to give to God if he's not asking for your firstborn. And then to top it off, he got, the, he got the child back. He got to take him home. And God provided his own sacrifice. I'm just talking about giving God our best. Do you know what happens if you don't give him your best? You give him the leftovers. You give, you, 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 you give, you know, you give God a tip. You know what God does? Not a whole lot. You're not giving him, you know, it, it, here's what I say. When you give God your best, you're sowing seed. You're sowing seed. That's what God can bless and multiply and send back your way. And again, I'm, I'm not just telling you a biblical principle. I'm telling you how it's worked in my own life, in my own family. And I'm thankful, and I praise the Lord for it. And the last thought that I have for you tonight, from verse 14 to, uh, to verse 19. <clears throat> and right here, we're just going to look <clears throat> beyond the blessing of getting Isaac off of the altar and taking him home with him. There was blessings beyond that. Notice with me verse 14. And Abraham called the name of the place Jehovah-Jireh. I'll come back to that thought. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be seen. And the angel of the Lord called unto Abraham out of heaven a second time. 
and said, By myself have I sworn, saith the Lord. Now here's something that God's saying and swearing about Abraham. For because thou hast done this thing, done what thing? Given your son and not held him back, and hast not withheld thy son, thine only son, in that blessing, he says, in that blessing I will bless thee. I'm going to give you a double blessing. I'm going to bless the blessings I send your way. And in multiplying, I will multiply thee. Thy seed as the stars of heaven, and as the sand which is upon the seashore, and thy seed shall possess the gate of his enemies. And in thy seed shall all the nations of the earth be blessed, because thou hast obeyed my voice. And so Abraham returned unto his young men. They rose up and went together to Beersheba, and uh, Abraham dwelt to Beersheba. I'm just saying, God blessed abundantly. What if he hadn't offered Isaac? What if he would have liked Jonah run the other way? I'm going to book me a ship. I'm going to take me a flight and get out of here. I'm not going up the mountain. I'm getting as far away from that as I can go. No, that's not what he did. He would have missed out on all the blessings. God. God. Think about this. God and the thought of God, the name of God, had new meaning to Abraham from that day forward. He called him Jehovah Jireh. You know what that means? God provides. God provides. Hey, do you know the God that provides? I've told you a couple stories about my own life tonight. He's Jehovah Jireh to me and to my family. He is. For years, my wife would ask me, well, uh, do I have grocery money? And there were times, I'll admit, there were times I'd have to say, honey, if you can wait a, a couple of days, it'll be here. Can we wait a couple of days? But God would always send it. But oftentimes, how much do you think you need? Well, I need about this much. Well, there's that much in there. And I had thought it was going to go to something else, but go ahead and go. Because I know God's going to take care of it. Because I've been faithful and I've given and I, I haven't held back from him just being honest with you he's jehovah jireh to me multitudes of times more than i can even explain did you know my yellow dodge caught fire last week lee was coming home from work one night trying to get to the tent revival <clears throat> calls me on the voice i could I, I, on the phone i could hear in her voice dad I'm on the side of the road. The truck caught fire. I'm envisioning, now it, when I say yellow Dodge, it's yellow. If you've seen it, uh, when she's done with it, I might paint stripes on it like a honeybee and use it for my bee business. I don't know, but I can't see. She, her and Sarah both, when they were driving, and people offer, hey, sell me that Dodge. I want that. I like that truck. Well, sure you do, but no. <laughs> no. So I'm envisioning on fire i'm thinking all oh, my yellow is now black i'm thinking i send the tow truck after it haul it to the scrap yard no no drove down the next morning fixed it for seven dollars drove it home why because god provides Still got my daughter and I got my truck. I'm just telling you, when you give God your best and you don't hold back, then all of a sudden you see what best is that God can do for you. And Abraham knew God by a new name. He says, now he's Jehovah Jireh to me. Second thought I have for you, from verse 15 to verse 18, we see that God made a new and greater covenant with him. In blessing, I'm going to bless you. In multiplying, I'm going to multiply you. And then in the last verse there, verse 18, he said, not only is this going to be known between you and me, but the whole world is going to be blessed by your obedience. The whole world. 
You know, Jesus came through by way of Abraham and Isaac. I'm just saying this. Whatever we might have, and, and, and quite frankly, if there's anything in my life that is precious to me, that's the first thing I want to offer to God. I get on my knees in the morning and pray for my family. God, they're your daughters. They're your sons. It's your, you gave me this wife, but God, she's really yours. God, you provided for me all the vehicles in my driveway, all this house that I'm living in. I, I thank him every morning for all the provisions, all of them. You know, I tell him, I'm heading to the bee yard. God, I wish you'd take care of your bees because I'm sure hot getting out here. But I'm just joking, but I, I acknowledge they're yours. They're not mine. That honey comes in. We bottle it up, sell it and do, do our thing with it. I take it and give it to missionary. You know, I probably, I don't know, I've given how many hundreds of pounds of honey away to pastors and missionaries and different ones and God still provides more finance through the honey than, than I mean press down running over last year there was a guy over here in southern Illinois I'm just going to tell on God for a second beekeeper we've been a keep beekeeper for years and, and there's a place online that we ask questions to one another and what have you and i had met him on there and he he sent me a private message one time uh and uh and asked me a question and i asked him a question we were talking because he's up in red bud not very far away from here and uh he asked me how how it was in fact i checked with him last this this past year with COVID. i was a little concerned about him being in illinois i mean You'd be concerned about your friends in Illinois, too. I mean, you ought to be. But anyway, I checked with him. He goes, how's your, how's your bees doing? How's everything going? And I said, well, I've got 1,200 pounds of honey. So 1,200 pounds of honey? Man, what are you going to do with all that honey? I said, well, I, you know, eat it and give it away and sell it. And He goes, man, I wouldn't know what to do with that much honey. Well, God's just blessing me. I don't know what to tell you. Identify in your life. Here's a little extra. Identify in your life what are the precious things to me. What is the most valuable things? And by things, I, 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 anything. Whatever is valuable in your heart, precious to you, just give it over to God. Here you are. It's yours. You're not giving it up you're putting it into somebody's hands that can do something with it I, I wish I remembered the whole story I, I think I have it on my computer I saved it somewhere but I didn't bring it with me and it just the Lord reminded me there was a, a guy that had an old Stradivarius violin a master I mean this guy was well known I can't recall his name now but he and he got to where he couldn't wasn't playing anymore and he dedicated it but the stipulation was no one else touches my violin you can put it on display he gave it up it was worth millions at the time years ago worth million. they put it in a glass case showed it off to the world curator took it out one time and it fell to pieces You don't use it, you lose it. You ever heard that one? You ever wonder about this? That time when the Lord said, hey, I give one five talents, another two talents. You know where I'm talking about? The guy with the one talent. Think we could find it and dig it up? The worms done ate it. Saw a story come across the headlines or sublines or whatever it was the other day. Years ago, some guy over in Europe somewhere, uh, old man, saved a bunch of cash. It was 
family story was he stored it away in the house that had been in the in the family for generations and it was stored there was a lock box in the house somewhere and they searched and searched and searched for years and generations searched for this lock box they finally got a guy to come in a, a guy that searches for hid treasures and he had his fancy uh, metal detector and all this stuff and and uh, he found it in the floorboards in the attic of the house because it was going to be sold. If I remember, I was forty-four thousand dollars from, I mean, from however long ago, hundred more years ago. And they're showing the lock box and the piles of cash in there. I said, you know what? If that guy would have just invested that in a bank account, it would have been worth millions. But he hid his talent away. He hid all his treasures. It was so precious to him that he hid it in the attic. And his kids didn't have benefit of it. And his grandkids didn't have benefit of it. And his great grand. And now, whatever generation it is, they got it. And you know what they got? <laughs> the face value of it. I'm just saying. Whatever's the most precious thing that you have, give it to him. Because he'll do a whole lot more with it and bless you because of it. And you might, you might not even lose use or ownership of it. But the blessings that come. Just one more thing before I let you go. I can't help but think about my daughter, Rachel. I'm missing my hugs. I'm missing, I, I, you know, and all of the other ones are trying to make up for it, and that is precious. I'm glad of it. I talked to her on the phone yesterday morning. She goes, Daddy, I sure miss home. I sure wanted to be under the tent with y'all, singing with them sisters and brothers I said I know honey but you know what God's using you right there God's using you and people lives are being changed and difference there's a difference being made there man what I wouldn't do for a good hug right now from Rachel But the truth of the matter is the wealth that's being stored up in heaven on behalf of my wife and I right now and I'm, I'm just bragging on God and I told you this morning what I'm going to do with it all I'm going to first thing I do when I get to heaven is I'm going to cash in my account whatever bank on the corner of glory and, and hallelujah street I'm going to go to the bank I'm going to here this is who I am and I'm going to take it straight to the Lord and say, there it is. There it is. It's everything. That was the best of the best of the best that I had, and here it is. I'm giving it to you. I'm going to give it to him again. Give God your best. The truth of the matter is, if you don't, you're wasting it. You're wasting it. Okay, would you come to the piano, please? Let's stand together tonight. Open your songbook to page 402. 402. It's just a two little, little two-verse song there. But if you can sing it with me.